Hey guys, this is Vanessa Dyer, and I'm the Charlotte, North Carolina-based lifestyle blogger behind thecheekybean.com. With several successful years as a business owner, a first-time mom, and a deep passion for health and wellness, I'm here to share my honest, unfiltered advice on all things motherhood, relationships, travel, and more. So grab a coffee and join the conversation. This is the Cheeky Bean Podcast. Here we are again, another episode of the Cheeky Bean Podcast. I am fresh off a week in New York City. Gosh, we had such a great week. It was absolutely crazy. I feel like time flew by. It was also warmer in New York than it is in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was kind of crazy because the whole point of going to New York was to see cooler fall weather. But nonetheless, we shot a lot of really cool content that I cannot wait to share with you guys. Stay tuned because I have a lot up my sleeve. On this episode today, we are going to be talking all things hair with Deren Mystery. Deren is the master of what I would call, quote unquote, the done undone haircut. He has developed quite the reputation over the last 20 years amongst New Yorkers and Londoners alike as the man to go see when you want your hair to look effortlessly cool. He is the master of the perfect bob, widely known amongst beauty editors. Deren is so charismatic. He's so easy to talk to. He's such a warm person to be around. He's extremely interesting, an entrepreneur, very well-rounded, and just a compelling person overall. Beyond his day job, he has also started a movement called Cut the Chemo, where he is calling on all hairdressers worldwide to offer free haircuts to children dealing with the grow back phase post-chemotherapy. I know this is really near and dear to his heart, and we had a great conversation around it. Definitely very emotional, but I am... 100% behind this cause and hope that you guys will get behind it too. Outside of that, Darren's coveted work has landed him in publications like Birdie, Forbes, New York Magazine, Pop Sugar, and many more. He's also the go-to guy for Brooklyn Decker, Dorinda Medley of The Real Housewives of New York. He's done Matt Damon's wife, Victoria Beckham, and many more. With that, let's welcome Darren Mystery to the Cheeky Bean Podcast. I'm so excited you're here. Me too. I have had the honor of getting to meet you since you moved to Charlotte from New York City. Mm-hmm. I feel like we've kind of become friends over the last, how many, has it been two years now? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah, Time flies. I, um, I moved in April 2021. 20, okay. Yeah. So. It's gone quick. Yeah. It has gone really fast. Um, so talk to me about your childhood. I know that you are really close with your family. Yeah. I, uh, I grew up in Northwest London. I went to a private boys' school, like, you know, very, very um, different path that I took going into hair. But, um, yeah, I went to a uh, city of London school for boys, like, basically figured out very young that I wasn't very academic, but it was kind of the thing to do. Right. All my parents wanted me to do and started doing hair at 23. I decided not to, to go to university because... Um, I thought it would be a waste of time for me because I knew I wasn't dedicated to studying. Um, Did you go to hair school? No, I did an apprenticeship. So um, there's a salon in London called Daniel Galvin. It's very famous, especially with color. The owner's uh, sons worked out at a gym that I was a member of at the time, and my best friend was a trainer at the gym. So I was like, can you put a good word in for me? I want to go and work there. And um, he connected me with them. I got in touch with the manager and I was like, I want to come and work and I think I want to do hair. And he was like, have you done it before? And I was like, no. So he was like, we don't have a position for anyone right now, but as a favor, you can come and hang out and do a trial. And um, I made a good impression and they ended up hiring me. About two weeks later, I got a phone call and they were like, you you know, there's a a position that opened up. Did you always know you wanted to do hair or how did you end up going down? Um, Does it run in the family? So I think... Part of like my upbringing, being from like um, an immigrant family, going to a private school, but like not being like English and white, um, but then being told that you're English because you're born there, you know, there was like massive identity issues. So hair was like the one thing that I could do that didn't just like pigeonhole me as like the little Indian kid. Yeah. So I went from being the little Indian kid to being like, oh yeah, you're cool, you're one of us, you have a cool haircut, like. You're not just like a nerdy little kid because I wasn't. Um, mm-hmm. So then I started playing around with my own hair and hairstyles. I was always obsessed with um, putting product. I put gel in my hair every single day going to school and I was like 10. 
Um, and like you didn't learn that anywhere. You just did that on your own. Well, I guess like from my mom, maybe my mom had short hair and she would style her hair and she was like, you know, wash your hair and brush your hair and like do something to it. So you didn't look like you just woke up, you know, like yeah. got out of bed and yeah. things were like sticking up everywhere. So I think the fascination with <clears throat> with with hair started then. And I think it was really a lot to do with my own identity because I just like I didn't know who I was and I didn't know how to express myself. So that all started with hair. So I get different haircuts and it was like, okay, you're, you're the cool kid because you shaved one side off or you did some color or whatever. So that's where the fascination with hair started. Okay. And it was always with my own hair, haircuts, hairstyles. Like I would go, I stopped going to barbers because they couldn't do the haircuts that I wanted. So I started you going to hair your, salons. Did it yourself? No, no, I never did it myself. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I probably shaved I was like, my that's head, pretty brave. No, no, no. I never did anything like that. I didn't know what I was doing, so I wouldn't have tried. Yeah. I'm way too much a control freak to, like, do that, like, yeah. trust myself <laughs> if I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. Even now, like, 20 years later, I don't think I would, apart from shaving my head, I wouldn't I wouldn't try and, like, do a fade or yeah. do layers or anything like that. Like I'm always so surprised when people who are injectors are like, yeah, I just give myself Botox. I'm like, yeah. what? I'm yeah. like you. I wouldn't trust myself. Yeah, I'd rather have a skilled professional do it and I don't have to lift my arms above my head. Like that right. hurts. That's you, Your arms get tired. Yeah. Which is why half the people like give up when they're styling their own hair. Yeah. So what, first of all, do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a younger sister. Okay. She's three years younger than me. She lives in the UK. Um, she doesn't do hair. She, I, was, I was getting ready she to was, ask that. No, so she was like the good one, in my opinion. She probably like academically. Yeah, I think growing up for me, I always found it hard to concentrate, and I, like my focus was just off. Maybe as an adult, maybe I have some ADHD. Like who knows? Never got tested for it. My sister was always like really good at school. She she like did her A levels and went to university, and she like took the path that like we were all expected to take as as young kids. She studied, moved out, and then um, is now married with a kid and lives just outside London. So she's closer to my parents than I am physically. Aww. Yeah. What do – I know you just mentioned, like, that's more the traditional path that you're expected yeah. to take as a kid. So what did your parents say when you're like, I'm not going to go to university and um, I'm actually going to do hair? So I think by the time I was – 16, 17, 18, I think they knew that like pushing me to study probably wasn't the best idea because I rebelled a lot. Mm -hmm. um, when I did my A-levels and I didn't do very well at them, it like reduced the opportunities of like good school, like good universities to go to. Right. So I had a place um, to do law and marketing. I was like, I want to do law. And then the school I was at was like, well, you're not going to get good grades. So you can't just do law, do it with something else. And so I had a place to do law and marketing at a school that I didn't, at a university that I didn't think was a good one. And I just, I was like, put it down to the fact that I was like, I was done. I was like, not about to like waste another four years of my life. So I was like, I want to go out and work. Yeah. Well, um, it's smart. Yeah. Well, my parents, I think at the time they, they wanted me to just figure it out. Mm-hmm but they didn't know what that meant for me. Like they couldn't decide for me and I didn't right. know what I wanted to do. So I actually like at 18 started working behind bars and nightclub. I was a bartender in a nightclub. Mm -hmm. I was a bartender in a very famous English strip club called String Fellows. Um, <laughs> and oh, uh, what was that like? Uh, an eye opener for a yeah. straight 18 year old boy. Yeah. Um, but my friends loved it because they would come and drink for free and then get to like watch the show. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I think back then that was my way of being like, look, I can dress how I want, you know, wear my earrings, like express myself through my clothes and my hair. And it was okay. Like I didn't, no one could tell me not to do that. Right. But obviously my parents worried about my future. So I'm lucky that I have parents that are still together and still alive and were able to support me until I was able to figure it out, which is kind of what happened. So at 23, I decided to like move back in with my parents, help my dad in his business. And he turned around to me and was like, look, you can't do this forever. Um, figure out something that interests you and that you're willing to like work at and I'll support you. And if you want to like whatever it is, just do it. Because I think, you know, he could see that I was like, like failing at life. Yeah. You know, I was like sleeping 
half the day and staying up late and drinking every day. And, you know, it was just like a party lifestyle. Right. It was fun, but yeah, it's not not forever. Yeah. So you're 23. 23. You starting. just moved back in with your parents. How do you go from that to working at David Mallet in New York City? I got a job in a very like high end salon in London, um, assisted a very talented French hairstylist from Paris and, you know, worked with him, traveled with him, assisted him. I did that for about four years whilst I got my qualification. So I was doing apprenticeship. So they would come and assess you every month. And then once I qualified, I decided to move over to Notting Hill to like a completely like trendy neighborhood, Portobello Road, um, and start like perfecting my skill set. And then after a couple years of doing that, I had this opportunity to meet. Uh, I was put in touch with John Barrett that was in Bergdorf Goodman. So, you know, 2010 Bergdorf's was like the place in New York. Once I was put in touch with them, I managed to land a job there and they were able to sponsor me to come out. So that's when I moved to New York. Was so, it like a mentor that connected you guys or how on earth did you end up getting connected with him like um, halfway across so the world? So John had once upon a time worked in London and I had uh, connections in salons in London. So my friend turned around to me one day and was like, oh, John was in town. Like I saw him and I was like, oh my God, you know John Barrett? And uh, she was like, yeah, I was like, I would love to move to New York and do hair in New York. And she was like, well, I can connect you. So I got in touch with them, emailed them, didn't hear back from them, and then took like a full day trip to New York. And I like went to the sun. I was like, look, I'm serious about moving. And they were like, okay, well, if you figure it out with the lawyers and like, we'll give you a job, but you have to do the rest. So mm -hmm. I had to pay a lot of money to a lawyer to, to do my like visa. And that's how I got my first job in uh, New York. Nice. But that was, David Mallet was like, oh God, nearly 10 years later. So yeah. John Barrett was 2011, worked in Bergdorf for six years and then moved down to Soho to Spoken Wheel. And that was like a big change for me because it went, I went from working in like, you know, midtown Manhattan, you know, view of Central Park down to like next to Chinatown in Soho and like Canal right. Street and like a bit grimy, but. Different vibe. Different vibe, but very cool, you know, like the work, the creativity down there was like much more, it was much more appealing to me at the time. I always wanted to work in Soho. So I was like, if I'm going to be anywhere in New York, I want to be in Soho. Yeah. Um, and then David opened his salon like a few streets away and it, it kind of came at a good time in my life. Like River was born. So life changed a lot for me at that time. And mm -hmm. when River was three months, I, I went to work at David Mallet. And that was 2019, beginning of 2019. Okay. You've received so much press. You have been, I know, in Forbes. You've been in Birdie. You're recently Birdie Boy. So how did you get your name out there to all of these editors? I mean, I feel like you're so popular um, amongst these editors. It's like So originally, that's really interesting because when I first moved to New York, the lawyer that I was working with at the time um, he was like, you know, the next visa that I was going to try and get to stay in the States was an O one, one which is uh, an alien with an extraordinary ability. So, um, you know, it's like for actors and sports people and people that want to come to the country that don't have like, uh, you know, a bank or like a corporate job to sponsor them. Right. So uh, as an artist, they were like, you know, you need um, letters of, of like referrals from people in the industry um, you know, press and stuff like that. So this is kind of full circle. So Hallie Gold, who is the like editor in chief of Birdie at the time was working front desk at John Barrett as a checking girl. And she was also, um, interning for, uh, Lauren Levinson, who, um, at the time was the beauty editor at real beauty. Mm -hmm. So I had, found this out and I said to Hallie, look, I need editors to come in. So will you send Lauren in and I'll give her a free haircut? And if she likes it, great. And if she doesn't, whatever, like, a, you know, yeah. it's just like a connection. And that's how I met um, Lauren. And now like obviously 10 years later, Hallie's like, she's the shit. She's yeah. like, sorry, I don't know if I could swear, but um, Hallie has been amazing throughout like, we've just stayed in touch and she just recently put me on the board um, for Birdie, uh, for like the board of reviews. So whenever they get stories in, um, they have 
certain people that that review the stories and they made me like one of the hair people oh that's awesome yeah. so i just that's found super that exciting yeah, that's pretty cool yeah um but yeah lauren levinson was at real beauty and then she went to l and then you know from there she she also would go to all these events and tell other editors about me and then i think at the time 2012 you know 2013 was started to use Instagram to like reach out to people and and be like, let me do your hair. So luckily for us at John Barrett, you know, such a prestigious salon in a great space. Um, a lot of the editors used to come in there. So I, I you know, that's just use my position. Yeah. To so, network. Yeah. Yeah. And it just kind of snowballed from that. Yeah. Those are a lot of really big publications. Yeah. Yeah. I've got some good ones. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about hair. So obviously that's your expertise. What are like, what's the main product people should be using for their hair? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Or some essentials. Well, I think the thing that um, most people don't concentrate on is the, is the health, is the scalp health. Mm -hmm. So the end of the day, hair grows out of your head and once it leaves your scalp, it's dead. Everyone's so focused on like making their hair healthier when they're doing so much to it to make it unhealthy, like, you know, heat damage and coloring and all these things. Whereas I think the focus should be on, on the health, on the scalp health. Um, so I think a really good shampoo is going to be good for your hair. Um, and then maybe a good styling product or a good leave in conditioner or oil, something to moisturize the ends. Um, mm -hmm. there's a million brands out there. If you had to name your best shampoo, what would it be? So actually I just, um, I've just, <laughs> Uh, stocked up. Um, there's a new hair care line called Rose from a uh, well-known hairstylist, and we are just starting to carry at the carriage house. Okay. I literally just got a package today. It's called Rose? Yeah, R-O-Z. R-O-Z. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, Brooklyn told me about it, and so I was like, okay, if Brooklyn Deck is behind it, I've got to check it out, and yeah. it's really nice. Okay. So they have shampoo, conditioner, um, treatment oil, styling oil, and a hair serum. So okay. it's like super simple, but great packaging, smells good. And it's like, it's a really nice product. I got to check it out. Where is it sold? At the Carriage House. At the Carriage House. Look at that. <laughs> um, they're going to be everywhere. I mean, I think they have a big online presence, presence. right now. And they're yeah. about to sell in anthropology and places like that. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. It'll be readily available, but I, I, I have some right now. Oh, I'm coming in to grab it. Cool. I got to try it. I'm yeah. always down for a good shampoo. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice stuff. <laughs> this is a hot take. But how often should people actually be washing their hair? So it really depends on your hair type and texture. Um, you know, some people can get away with washing it once a week. Some people wash it every day. Everyone's different. It depends on your hair type. So it's a, that's a very hard question to ask. But yeah, if your hair is looking greasy or smelling bad, then wash it. <laughs> that makes sense. I feel like, um, you know, we used to be told you have to wash your hair every single day. And then like over time, it was like, well, washing your hair every single day yeah. isn't actually good for your hair. You know, you should wash your hair two or three times a week. But well, I think the rules have changed because um, back when shampoos were full of sulfates, obviously constant shampooing would dry your hair out because of all the sulfates. Right. Now there's a lot of sulfate free shampoos. So um, that argument is kind of redundant. We do know that shampooing your hair can dry it out. You know, shampooing daily can dry it out. But then again, if you're using something then that's not drying, then then that argument's redundant. So again, I think it just depends on the on the hair type and texture and also the product you're using. Mm -hmm. You mentioned scalp health. What should people be doing? Like, is there a serum or something or like an exfoliator that people should be using for their scalp? Um, I think good products help, right? Good, good shampoo. Um, Something that a lot of people could can do is use a little bit of apple cider vinegar to to um, to correct the pH levels. Okay. But yeah, I think generally scrubbing, washing, and scrubbing properly is, is like kind of overlooked. People just like stand on the shelf five minutes and they're like, "Oh, yeah, it's done." Mm -hmm. um, I always tell people to like whatever you're using, just keep rinsing because the last thing you want is build up on your scalp because that can dry the scalp out and right. can also cause some problems down the line so right um the best advice i can give anyone is like extra rinsing okay yeah good to know what trends are you seeing people come and ask you for i know you spent so for for those of you who aren't familiar 
um, you spend one week a month still in New York City, yeah. and then the other three weeks you're here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Yeah. So what trends do you see people repeatedly coming in to ask for, and are they different between Charlotte and New York City? I don't think they're different because at the end of the day, if it's a trend, then a trend is like global, you know, like people are on Instagram and TikTok and whatever. So um, you're all going to see it in, at the same, like in real time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the biggest difference between like the work that I'm doing in New York and Charlotte, I feel like in Charlotte, um, inherently people just like trust that I know better because I'm doing it in New York. Trends kind of happen with haircuts. Like if everyone's trending on a bob and then people are like all getting bobs and then it's like the natural progression from a bob is to a lob. Or right. what else are you going to do? Like, oh, I'm going to do some face framing or cut bang. So I think these things just happen automatically and they don't really, like, people don't really realize it's happening to them. Right. You know? Like, it's almost like everyone hops on the bandwagon of the trend, but and then, then the trend phases out and exactly. then you need a new trend. And then all of a sudden, bangs are the trend. It's like, well, that's because right. they couldn't do much else apart from cut bangs in because right. they didn't have bangs in the first place. So it's like, you know, you, you're, you're, you'll have a bob. And then you have a, a blunt bob and then you're like, oh, now a layered bob is in. It's like, well, what else are you going to do to the bob yeah. to change it? <laughs> True. So I think sometimes trends just happen because of what the last trend was. Right. Like off the back of it. Yeah. I feel like I'm a prime example of that. Like I went super short and then I kind of went the lob yeah. route for a little while. And now I'm down to this like medium length thing and I yeah. like putting it up. And But I think with trends especially, I've never, I've never like – resided to the fact that that's what I'm going to do. I, I think it also has to suit the person. So right. if it doesn't suit you, it doesn't matter. You know, like I'm not going to give you a bob if I don't think a bob's going to look good on you. Right. Even if it's trending and you ask for it. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, uh, if people are not local to New York City and Charlotte and they can't come in and see you, what should they be asking their stylist for? I think whatever they have done, um, one of the biggest things I tell clients uh, especially if they're not coming to see me and if they're unsure of how they feel about their haircut or color when it's been done, um, the easiest way to see it is when it's dry. And if it's blown smooth or straight, especially, you're going to see inconsistencies in the shape or the color. Even if you don't wear it straight, it's a really easy check. And even for me as a professional, um, I do a lot of dry cutting and a lot of the time I can't really see a haircut until I blow it out straight and then I can see if there's holes or imperfections or, you know, things are out of shape or uneven. So if you're getting your hair done and you're not quite sure, get the stylist or colorist to blow it out smooth and at least you'll be able to see it better. And if if you can't, they definitely will. And if they don't see it, then you're in the wrong chair. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. What does Brooklyn Decker come in and ask you for? The first time I did Brooklyn's hair, um, she kept length. So we put more shape in it and like framed her face and stuff like that. Um, The second time was when we like chopped it, um, which was kind of spur of the moment. I mean, she posted about it and there was like a timestamp and it was like a couple hours from when she texted me to her actually coming in and doing it. Um, I think she had decided that she wanted to cut it off. Um, So we talked about, you know, where, where that would be. But the bob has got shorter since the first time we did it. So yeah, I think that was just like a joint conversation. Yeah. Um I'm I'm glad that she trusted me to do it and I think it looks amazing on her. It um, does. Yeah, it, it's like it's it's really short right now. Yeah. Um but she obviously looks good whatever she does. Right. Um but it does suit her short and I think she's liking it short as well. Yeah. Which I'm glad about. I really feel like that's the trend right now. Bobs? Yeah. Just or even lobs. I feel like everybody is dyeing their hair brown and cutting it off short. Yeah, I think lobs right now are kind of a little bit cooler because they haven't been around in a while. Yeah. You know, like everyone grew their hair out. So now that everyone's going back to bobs, again, like talking about like trends that just happen, I think it's like the natural progression of the bobs is now the lob. Right. You know, you grow it yeah. out a little bit and you go through these awkward stages where it flips off your shoulder. Yeah. And then once it kind of gets passed down to your collarbone, it's like, okay, it's a lob now. Yeah, I feel like for the longest time, the trend was like the really long hair with the extensions and people were getting the hand-tied rows and clip-ins and just a lot of volume. And now it's like everybody's getting rid of their extensions. I think that was more of a trend here. 
versus New York City? I think so. I mean, definitely with my clientele. Um, you know, I'm always trying to promote like the best natural hair and mm -hmm. I'm trying to get the most out of what you have. So for me to like promote that, it would kind of goes against what I'm saying because that's not you living with what you have. That's you changing it sure. completely. Um, you know, I get it for weddings and special occasions and clippings and things like that. But like, you know, the the things that are more permanent, um, those people still need a good haircut, but um, generally they're they're more reliant on the actual like hair itself than right. the haircut. Yeah. Um, so my haircuts have always been like, let's work with what you have and get the most out of that, um, as opposed to, okay, it's not working short, like let's just make it long again. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Was there a pivotal point in your career? Like, was there a celebrity that you worked with that really kind of set things off and your career took off from there? Or was it more of a slow build? Um, I think it was more of a slow build. Like, I think that working all the different salons and having different insight into what people like and want, um, depending on which area I worked in, whether it be downtown or uptown or Soho or Portobello Road or wherever it was, I think um, taking a little bit from every place I worked helped. Yeah, I don't think there was like one moment because um, I think everything kind of is like cumulative, right? Like mm -hmm. a little bit of everything along the way. But maybe maybe now's my moment. <laughs> maybe, maybe now's your moment. Maybe the is, is the thing. Yeah. Or cut the chemo is the thing. Yeah. Um, are there any specific personalities that you won't work with? No, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely like behind the chair. I always want to be challenged and like also prove people wrong. If you think that you can't have something or do something, your hair won't do it. I want to be the person that can do it for you just because I, I think that's part of the challenge. But personality wise, like if you're an asshole, then I don't like if you're not nice and that you're not nice, like I don't want to see you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the carriage house is such a, an amazing environment and it's super chill and, you know, it's a small space. So like any bad energy in there, I don't, I don't want it. Right. Um, and I, luckily for me, I'm in a point in my career where I can, I can kind of dictate who I see. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think like, 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 likes, like, right. Like you, you, you attract what you put out. So I try and put out as much good vibes as possible, and I, d I don't really get ourselves in my chair, basically. That's amazing. I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, sorry, I don't like you. Right. You know, but, but I can't give someone a bad hair. I would never do that. Right. Um, I would much rather give you the best haircut you've ever had and want me to do your hair and then just say I can't do your hair anymore. Yeah. But I can't, I can't, get, I can't like, maliciously cut someone's hair. Like, yeah. It's just not. It's not who I not am. Not who you are. No. Yeah. What inspired you to leave New York City? Raising a family. So when we had my first son, River, um, I think at the time we were both just doing our thing and our careers were fine and, and New York was fine and, and it was manageable. Once we had two, I think that was the bigger change. And then also the pandemic. Definitely like kids and family, you know, prioritizing that. Um, that was like the big draw. And then obviously my wife's family are, are now all here. So that helps. Yeah. I can imagine raising a family in New York city is probably not the easiest location. Yeah. And I think now, now that I've moved and now that we're here, not that I don't love Charlotte cause I do. I think that seeing my boys grow up with like that, that love around them, mm -hmm. I'd, I'd move to the end of the world for that because it's about them and right. I want them to be happy and have good lives. And I think like that's how we're going to make them better people is to, to like just give them an abundance of love. You know, like a lot of people that grow up around their grandparents, like end up being good people. I can't, I, I, don't, I feel like I don't know people that are assholes that, that grew up with their grandparents. True. It's like another set of eyes to like judge you and like put you in your place. Yeah. And then also like, you know, you don't want to tell your parents, but you could tell your uncle, your aunt or your grandparents. And right. I feel like those those people grow up happier and healthier and all that stuff. So um, I think it's like a really good thing to bring a lot of love around your children. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Would you say that the people in New York truly are different than the people here? 
I think the people in New York are just busy. Mm -hmm. Not that people are here aren't busy, but I think um, sometimes New Yorkers get a reputation for for being rude or, or mm -hmm. blunt or short. I think they're just, they're like in their own world. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people in New York City. So um, anytime you ever stop someone and talk to them, they're always super nice. So I, I, I like New Yorkers. You know, I like people, so yeah. I think there's good and bad people everywhere. Yeah, very true. I think, too, to your point, in New York, it's almost like it's, you know, we're here in the South and we have that Southern hospitality mentality, yeah. and so you always want to talk to people and you always want to be friendly and you always want to help. Yeah. And in New York, it's kind of like, you know, like you were saying, everyone's so busy, they're just a little uninterested or, like, oblivious to what's yeah. going on around yeah. them. Yeah, well, like, as soon as you stop someone – and you ask them something, they're, they're actually nice. And then again, New Yorkers are from all over as well. So mm -hmm. that's true. Um, you know, you never know who you're going to come across. Yeah, there's 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 characters in New York. I think yes. it's like part of the fun of being there. Yeah, like people from all over. People just like completely wild. It's a melting pot. Yeah. Is there if someone's out there who's listening who wants a recipe to kind of jumpstart their career? What advice would you give them for success? Don't give up. And I think that's like the most important thing in anything is like if you really want to do something, don't let anyone stop you. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you if you like if you don't believe in yourself, then then it's pointless. But if you believe in yourself and other people don't like don't just block it out. Just keep doing it and keep showing up and keep saying yes and never say no to things. Yeah, I think you have to be available and you have to be willing to do stuff and and it's not uh, you know i think a lot of the things nowadays like everyone wants to make sure they're going to get paid right and no one's going to take advantage of me and all this stuff and when i started out it was like that's kind of the norm like if if someone else wasn't going to do like somebody else would take your space in a in a, in a minute mm -hmm. so you had to say yes and you had to be available and you had to work for free and do all of that stuff so I think people should focus on 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 what they really want mm -hmm. from like their careers or or lives, and just like work towards it and not give up. You yeah, know, it doesn't you know? I've been doing it for twenty years, and like there's been numerous points in my in my earlier like career that I was like, am I doing the right thing? And am I gonna be able to survive? And but again, I just never stopped doing it. So I think it's really important to not give up. Yeah, I think uh, something that I hear a lot with a lot of the people that we interview on the podcast who are all very successful in their careers is the perseverance and consistency. Like yeah. it's kind of like a repetitive yeah. thing that everybody who has a thriving, successful business that they've had no handouts for and have completely started yeah. from the ground up have all unanimously said it takes a lot of grit. It, it, it takes never saying no yeah. and just being consistent day yeah, in and day out. I think I think again, like from an outside perspective, like if someone blows up on social media or if someone gets recognition for something that they're good at, no one ever sees the backstory to it. No one knows how many hours they put into this trade or craft that that right. they're, that they're now getting recognition for. So um, it's really easy to sit back and be like, "Oh, like look what they're doing now." It's like, well, no one was watching before because it wasn't important, mm -hmm. but it was important to that person. So I think again, like, you know, the the world, the world watches when it wants to see things, and when it doesn't, like, it's just on you to like not give up and keep doing it. Right. Yeah, and I, th I think that takes a specific type of personality too. Um, I disagree. Really? Yeah, cuz another hot take. No, I think um <laughs> I think regardless of your personality, if you're into something, if you if you're really passionate about it, then then it's on you, right? Yeah. So it's not a personality because there'll be 10 different personalities, they could all be into different things, but unless they kept at it, you know, they're not going to be successful. So yeah, I think the difference that I see, and I'm just speaking in terms of like my own position and line of work, but I never leaned on anybody else to help me. I yeah. always 
did the research and the homework on my own and spent countless hours trying to figure out how to do things, how to set things up. And the one thing that I noticed, and I don't know if it's just a change in generations maybe, yeah. but the one thing I noticed is I can't tell you how many times a day somebody messages me and they're like, hey, I'm trying to start a blog. Like, can I grab coffee with you? I'd love to pick your brain about how to do this. Yeah. And I just think right off the bat, if you haven't even started and you're only way of trying to figure out how to start is to lean on somebody else who has yeah. already done it, you really aren't the type of person who's self-motivated. Like you have to want to figure those things out. It's all yeah. on Google. I mean, well, you can Google literally how to do anything. I think a lot of those people are the same type of people that that don't know what they want and they keep seeing what other people are doing. And then they're like, oh, I'm gonna reach out to Vanessa because I like what she's doing. Or I'm mm. gonna reach out to this person. They actually just don't know what they want. Yeah, that's possible. Right. Because yeah. if they did, then they would be trying to do it on their own like you did, like I right. did. Like, Well, and the thing I found is like when when I do spend my time doing that, like what they're looking for is somebody to handhold them along the way yes. versus truly sitting down and taking notes and being like, okay, I'm going to take this as yeah. tangible advice and go implement it. Like yeah. they're just looking for ha being yeah. handheld. They're not taking the right initiative. Right. right. Yeah. They're, they think by reaching out to you, they're taking the initiative. But right. really there's – a lot of resources out there that they could right. they could probably get further on their own if they really tried. Yeah, I mean, first thing you do, Google, how do I start an LLC? It's literally the number one hit right there. You click on it and it walks you straight through how yeah, to do it. And yeah, then, totally. you know, it's one step in front of the other. You just got to keep going. But but I think, again, it's like if you're unsure, then how, how are you supposed to know? You know, and mm -hmm. I think, again, it's like, OK, if you don't know, then keep trying things until you find something that you enjoy. Yeah, that's a really good point. OK. Talk to me about Cut the Chemo. So I know this is an initiative that you recently have put out there on social media. Yeah. I love your heart behind it, and I feel like this is a really good platform to kind of spread awareness yeah. for what it is. So for those who are not familiar. So Cut the Chemo is a movement that I came up with because I realized uh, over the years of doing hair and, and seeing people that have come out of chemo and how chemo can affect people's hair and stuff, it occurred to me that anyone growing their hair back from short is already difficult. It's a difficult thing to do because um, it goes through awkward stages, like it grows over your ears or down your neck. And mm -hmm. and those aren't big haircuts. They just need a bit of tweaking, a bit of shape, especially when you've gone through something as, as like big as chemotherapy. Um, so I had this idea to, to help children, especially because Again, as I was a little insecure child and didn't know who I was and where I was supposed to be in this world, um, your hair is a big part of your identity. So if you're already insecure and have a low self-esteem, um, you've just come out of hospital and you've just gone through something so tragic, um, getting a haircut can dramatically change the way you feel about yourself and the way that the world sees you. Mm -hmm. um, so Cut the Chemo really is to help children um, grow the hair back post chemo, um, whether it be like a little tidy up or like, oh, my hair's curly now because the chemo, the radiation and all the, uh, all the chemotherapies changed the texture of their hair. Um, they also don't know what to do. Like they didn't have curly hair before and now they do. So as a hairstylist, we have the ability to not only help them on their way, but educate them about how to wear their hair, how to style their hair and what to do and how to get kind of through those awkward stages. So that's kind of what Cut the Chemo like started as. Now, since talking to Levine's, um, we got in touch with them through um, Gracie, who was the first girl that I met. Um, Gracie and her mom, Jenny, are amazing. Um, I'm gonna get emotional talking Aww. about it. Um, You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's heavy. It's yeah. really heavy. Um, God, I didn't think I was going to get emotional talking about this. Um, so I met Gracie. She's 10, right? She's 10. Um, she's cancer-free, which is great. So Jenny reached out to me and said, like, you know, my my daughter's growing her hair back. And it was, like, kind of random because I was already trying to, like, do this thing. Mm -hmm. So it was, like, really serendipitous because I was, like, trying to kind of get the ball rolling. And then um, her mom reached out to me randomly and was like, hey, do you cut kids' hair? Like, my daughter's going through this thing. I was like, this is amazing. I kind of wanted to like do this anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so it was her mom that put me in touch with Levine's and then we we put the video out there and then Levine's um, 
I actually had a meeting with them and they loved the idea. So then they were like, okay, well, something that we do for, for kids is uh, when they check out, when they finish like their treatment, they give them resources that, you know, things that can help them like wig makers and all these things. Mm -hmm. And they were like, well, we'll tell them about you and your movement so that they can come and get a haircut. So I was like, great. So that's how it started. So I've uh, cut Gracie's hair twice. Um, and she's still she's, she's cancer free as well. She's amazing. Such a doll. She's so sweet. And, and then just... she cut my hair as well. She shaved my she head. She did? Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah, we filmed it. It was yeah. like cute. I was like, look, I've cut your hair twice now. Do you want to cut mine? Yeah. And uh, yeah. So that I've done Grace's hair twice. I just met another really sweet girl called Madeline. Um, we cut her hair last week. She's 12. Unfortunately, she's not uh, cancer free yet but she's going through a different form of chemo so she won't lose her hair. So we were able to cut it. Um, we gave her a really cute little pixie. Um, so that's where we're at with that. And um, long term, I would love to see more hairstylists like globally doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be really cool to see, to just have a resource for all these parents out there that have kids that are in this weird transition of, like having been really sick and now they're better and they just need a, a pick me up and a good haircut. So um, hopefully we can get cut the chemo to like take over the world. Yeah, I love that. So if there is a hairstylist that's listening to this and they want to help out and offer their services for free for cut the chemo, how can they get started? Uh, I think right now the the easiest thing that they can do is like, you know, just shout about it and tell their clients and tell whoever they want. Um, if they know anyone or they can ask people around them, if they know anyone that needs this, mm -hmm. um, they can put it on their social media and stuff like that. I'm trying to put together something um, on a website that hairdressers and parents can watch and read and listen to. Um, trying to explain the movement better for people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be cool um, once I have the website launched that they could go online, read about it, learn about it, and decide whether they want to take part in it or not. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. it, and it, like long term I'd love to have an app that's mm -hmm. location-based. So You can search like a cut the chemo friendly salon yeah. in the app. Yeah, so just like closest to your like person and then – and then reach out and then yeah. the rest will take care of itself. Well, even on the website, you could put together a list of, you know, um, salons or yeah. hairstylists. So it will that... start off as a directory. Yes. But I am I want it to be more than just the list. Yes. Yeah. You know, if you, were, if you went on the list, you'd have to scroll through the whole list to find uh, what's most convenient to you. Whereas right. if it's an app and you, you just search click on the app. by zip code yeah. or something. Exactly. You put, you put where you are. And then could find people that way. So that's like, that's long term. I need to work on that and find someone that wants to build an app for me. Yes. Well, if there's anyone listening to the podcast and you want to build an app, yeah, exactly. here's your opportunity. <laughs> Reach out. Yes. Um, I think that is, that movement is great. I, anyone who's listening, who's able to help out, I would urge you to reach out and maybe they can start the conversation with you. Yeah. And if you have any questions, that's all it is. I think it's like conversations, like yeah. talking about it, putting it out there. That's how this whole thing happened. You know, I kept talking about it, kept putting it out there and then eventually Matt, Gracie and Jenny and, and then Jenny put me in touch with Levine. So I think like anything, you know, you put it out into the world and keep talking about it. It will happen. That's how I feel about work and life and, Moving sure. and building a business and yes, starting a my charity. husband always says, "Speak what you seek." One hundred percent. He's like, put it out into the ether yeah. and like manifest. Yeah, I mean, I think when I met you, I was like, I'm gonna have a salon in Charlotte. Yes. And I didn't have clients. No, yeah, that's true. And I met you and Meryl, and I was like, I'll do your hair. Just come in. Yeah, I know it's so true. So I think you have to you have to talk about things for them to happen. For sure. You, the, it's one thing having goals and like having ideas in your head, but until you start like actually putting it out there into the world, mm -hmm. um, that's the only way that these things are going to come true for you, I think. I would agree with that. Well, where can everybody find you? Probably the easiest place is Instagram. So Durham Mystery Hair um, or The Carriage House CLT. Um, the website? website is com. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me.